Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Leonard, and I am chair of the ECS Library and Information Services Committee. Thank you very much for joining us today, and welcome to our inaugural episode of our new library webinar series, Lessons from the Library. Today's webinar is called Brave New World, Artificial Intelligence and Academic Integrity. Before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know about our upcoming webinar on June 19th, when Jillian Rudes, founder of the company Manga and Libraries, and Dean the Manga Maven by Library Journal, she'll talk to us about the value of Manga and Libraries and how it can be a support system for the social emotional development of students. You can register at the link, uh, which I'll be putting in the chat in a little bit. Today's webinar session will be recorded and available online for your viewing pleasure within the next few days. We will share the, that out to everyone when it's available. Well, we also will post links to it on our webpage and our Facebook group. And if you haven't joined us on Facebook yet, you're welcome to do so anytime. I'll post those links in the chat in a moment. During the webinar, cameras can be on or off, but please mute your audio. And we encourage questions from the audience and time will be allotted at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Any questions you have during the session can be put in the chat and I'll moderate them throughout the presentation and I'll share them with the presenter during, um, during the presentation and at the question and answer portion at the end. And now without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker, Vivian Blake. Vivian Blake is high school librarian at EF Academy in Thornwood, New, Thor Thornwood, New York in the US. She specializes in developing research skills that prepare students for college and university. Academic integrity is both a guide and a challenge in the 21st century. Vivian helps students learn to select digital tools that safeguard academic integrity, encourage their unique voices, and contribute meaningfully to a collective pool of knowledge. Artificial intelligence is a passion of hers, and she enjoys exploring its development in relation to education. Welcome, Vivian, and thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and good day to everybody. It's such a pleasure, and uh, it's a privilege to present, and I'm so happy that you could join us. So let me share my screen. So it's it's rather um, interesting that uh, both artificial intelligence and academic integrity share the same acronym, AI. Let's hope they move in the same direction. For the purposes of my presentation, I'll really try to spell out academic integrity versus artificial intelligence, unless it's really clear that I'm speaking about one or the other. So. First of all, I'd like to tell you uh, about my recent experience at the International Center for Academic Integrity. Uh, there was a conference in early March, which now seems very long ago, uh, where I attended as the only high school librarian in the entire organization. It is really about 99% comprised of academic integrity officers and professors from colleges and universities. It's a worldwide organization. And I really was given a, an, just a really clear and dazzling view of what the landscape looks like at the college and university level for academic integrity and what these lovely professional colleagues are grappling with. Uh, primary and secondary librarians are more than welcome to join this great organization. And I've put a link here on my slide because it really is worthwhile considering. There, we're all part of the same educational landscape from one stage to another in students' lives. So it's really good if we can be connected with each other. So. Um, on the screen, you'll see um, a, a book cover image of um, the case study collection. Uh, this was actually how I was involved with the ICIA. I answered a call for proposals and I submitted a case study which was included in this publication. It's in chapter two. So uh, this, uh, this kind of spurred me to join the ICIA and then try, you know, try to encourage others to join with me so just so we can start sharing all the knowledge that we have. Because really what it comes down to is 
the tech will change, but the challenge will remain the same. So when I first started writing my case study with my co-authors, David Collette and Alexa Mazarakis, um, this was around December 2021. The big buzzwords then were the metaverse. The new AI writing tools were HyperWrite and QuillBot, amongst others. But then fast forward to March 2023, um, this book, Building Honor in Academics, was published in January. I attended the conference in March, and already we were talking about Chat GPT-3. This conference actually took place just prior to Chat GPT-4 coming out. So the challenges really are what we, we've always known them to be. We need to help our classroom colleagues and each other authenticate student work, help the students make sure that they provide authentic work, develop their independent learning and research skills, and promote critical thinking and integrity, because it's more important than ever. Uh, and this really starts with, I think, the human guidance of determining what the AI tools can and cannot do, and what they should not do as well. So there are six characteristics about academic integrity, and this book emphasizes all of them. And it's really it's really important that um, if our academic integrity policies only say academic honesty at the top, that we updated to think about academic integrity because we've got the six aspects. Um, honesty is where it all starts, but we have to be able to trust each other and trust the work. We have to promote a sense of fairness. When we talk about respect, we need to make sure that we listen actively. It means that we really uh, take other people's work into consideration, that we really treat them with the, the way that we would wish to be treated as well. And uh, integrity also, it's a responsibility of all of us. And especially for students, it can often take courage to speak up about um, issues where uh, academic integrity um, is in danger. And sometimes students really feel they, they feel they don't want to, they feel the peer pressure not to. So the book talks about each of the six aspects, and they're really good to emphasize um, in discussions with students because it's so much more than just honesty. Honesty is only the great starting point, but it really fans out to all kinds of ethical decisions that students will develop now and carry with them throughout their lives. So when I was at this conference, uh, what um, my professional colleagues told me was that uh, high school students really do need practice with college level resources, uh, which means that we need to be able to provide um, databases and um, tools that will help students. It's, it's okay to search Google with proper filters, but we never want that to be the only um, source that we use. Uh, the solid research skills require practice and reinforcement. So the sooner that we can start those, as we all know, the better. Uh, the critical thinking skills govern decisions that often have nothing to do with the subject, but can send students off in um, a wrong direction. We also need to provide that safe space because questions don't always arise immediately. We need to give the students time to think about the questions that they realize they need to ask. And we need to let them learn from mistakes now so that they'll be much more effective at the college and university level. Plus, they'll bring with them their sense of academic integrity if there's enough of a culture in the primary, middle, and high school levels. And I would just like to point out too, uh, I love where I work with students at the high school level, but I cannot do my good work without the wonderful foundational work of primary and middle school librarians. They give us the foundation um, to work with these students and prepare them for college. And uh, just thinking back to somebody like Carol Kofa, students do struggle and they're tempted now in the era of ChatGPT to maybe make some short-term decisions that have terrible long-term consequences, but they struggle and they're frustrated. So this is where the zone of intervention is where the librarians can come in and help the students develop learning skills that they need. So some of the highlights from the ICA conference, at the time, ChatGPT 
dominated the discussions. Now that this is just one gener generative AI tool, but it's become because it was kind of first out of the box, so to speak, on such a widespread level, it became kind of a buzzword. Uh, we talked about the need for strong research skills, the need for a K through 12 curriculum with artificial intelligence and information school skills written in. And from the research that I've seen, there's no comprehensive curriculum yet, but it's essential. We've got to do this now. Um, we talked about student data ownership loss following those free to use tools on the internet. Um, there's a lot of fine print that people don't bother reading. And um, if you if you use a, a tool rather than the best tool of all, which is your fabulous brain, these free to use tools are never free. They always want some kind of data from you. And then we don't know where it goes. We don't know who gets to use it. We don't know uh, when it's going to come back to, uh, you know, affect a student badly. So they were very, very concerned at the college level about those free to use tools. So I think from our end, if we make sure that we use um, really good tools like Noodle tools, for instance, if we provide critical thinking instruction, if we just help coach students through the very hard process of learning to paraphrase and just counsel patience and perseverance, it's we're, it's going to be a lot better. Um, institutions are struggling to write policy for AI because things are so fast moving and you have to you have to really think about the language that will help provide clear guidance to students and close loopholes. Initially, um, the IB uh, had written, um, you know, a statement about um, citing ChatGPT. And for a lot of attendees at um, the ICAI conference, uh, that, that response struck them as a bit reactive. Um, they really, they really want to make sure that students do original research. But of course, uh, at that level, there are more resources for st university students to use. At the at the school level, we are sometimes constrained. So um, while we can certainly consider how to use ChatGPT as a source, it's only an indirect source at best. It's kind of like a gateway, like Wikipedia is. You never really read Wikipedia before you read the references at the end of the Wikipedia article. So, um, my particular case study was called Where in the Metaverse is Boris's Voice? I had no idea at the time it would be quite so prescient, but I had wanted to submit a case study that centered around students and that would have some longevity, you know, an, a, a topic that we'd be talking about, not just for a month and then something else would replace it, but really kind of a long-term issue. So now, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I developed an information skills timeline and I bring it back now because I think now it's more important than ever. Uh, you may have already done so at your school, but it may be time to revisit. It may be time to think about where artificial intelligence tools, uh, use, guidance, instruction could be placed in such a, a vertical articulation or a timeline of skills. So this is what um, my original uh, timeline looked like several years ago. And it's I started with grade six and went through grade 12, but I made sure I consulted our primary school librarian at the, to see where um, the academic integrity and uh, information skills began and ended for her uh, K through five grades. So this is what it looks like kind of as a, um, you know, kind of a end to end thing. And then of course, for each grade, uh, you can put your skills in and it really, each one is unique. It can vary from year to year. It can it it depends on your population. It depends on your curricula. It depends on your location. Um, you know, you may be able to create a culture where you can really advance the timeline and have more advanced skills at a at a younger grade level if you have a relatively stable population and you know you've made those advances. But otherwise, you know, you also can just just monitor from year to year to see where your students are at and try and give them some reasonable stretch goals. I, I think stretch goals are a great thing. So 
it doesn't it doesn't have to be perfect right now, but I think it's a good idea to try and at least map out where we could put possible AI tools, guidance, use, and instruction. Thinking about how important evaluation is, especially now. You know, an updated K through 12 curriculum instruction is essential and we have to develop it because artificial intelligence tools are now a permanent part of our landscape. And we do have a population that I think we, at least at the middle and high school level, are going to have for the next seven or eight years. These are students who not only suffered the negative effects of lockdown and you know didn't have the chance to really develop some social and learning skills, but they've also navigated thus far through a school system that is pre-AI. So we need to give them extra scaffolding. So when developing a timeline of information skills, it's really great to consult librarian colleagues um, who come before and after your particular grades in the continuum. Uh, and as I said, they can be unique to your school and they don't have to be perfect. They just have to be effective and workable for you. And then it's, it's always good to share them with, uh, you know, talk about them with other colleagues like we do in ECIS. Now, academic integrity policies the updates will just have to be more frequent. They really have to be living documents. Personally, I feel that students should sign an agreement every year. There's something about having to sign and physically connect your pen and fingers to that paper that really helps solidify, this is a commitment. This is an ethical decision that we all need to make. And at the college and university level, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, they really do have to grapple with academic integrity uh, issues that can involve um, uh, legal counsel. Uh, they involve student privacy. Um, they, they're, they're constantly encountering new um, uh, potential ways that students can find loopholes. And um, we really have to, first and foremost, state in our academic integrity policies, what, what is authorized or unauthorized use of genitor, genitor, generative AI tools? Because students are gonna have to learn how to use them too. It's really important that we give them guidance so they can make good decisions about when and how the tools should be used. All right. Now, when I was at the ACAI, uh, I attended an absolutely wonderful workshop by Jesse Townsend. You can find him on LinkedIn. He works in a small college in South Carolina, and his academic integrity workshops are both proactive and restorative. So uh, something he talked about, and maybe you already do this at your school. I certainly would like to do this at a better, uh, better level at my school. This is my first year at EF student involvement in supporting academic integrity. I think, uh, you know, an honor council doesn't work without student participation. And to help them uh, understand that uh, it's to their benefit to take ownership of their learning skills and to, you know, reach some stretch goals. What if they wrote some case studies? What if they wrote some case studies about academic integrity that would let us adults know where their perspective is, because I think we have to, I think we have to give guidance, but we, I think we also have to meet students where they are. This is a new world. And, you know, we have to establish trust, respect, a sense of fairness and responsibility, courage, honesty, all these things that um, we talk about when we talk about academic integrity, we have to live and breathe them. So a student designed academic integrity workshop might be really helpful because oftentimes uh, maybe, we, maybe we focus on one type of student. Maybe it's the really smart student, but there are a lot of students who struggle. There are a lot of students who love to play games till 4 a.m. in the morning, and they're very smart, but they just might not be so academically inclined. I'd like to know where, where they come from, because I think that is going to give us insight in how to speak effectively to them so that we can really establish the two-way understanding. So uh, 
we also need to focus on the learning process rather than the end product. And I know our system has always been that way, but uh, the part of the joy of, um, of research is it is the learning process. You learn more as you go along and you, you have more questions that you have to answer. So another aspect that uh, my colleagues at ICA talked about a lot, which was which very concerning to them, was um, they really feel that uh, reflection gives them so much more of an understanding of student learning. What they really fear are the plausible arguments. When something is just plausible enough to sound like a student wrote it, but maybe a student did not, and it just came from chat GPT. So we really have, it's, it's, it's constantly on our minds now because it's hard to really see unless we really listen to our students and look at the whole drafting and editing process, is this the student's voice, which was also the subject of my, of my case study. So for academic integrity um, support, it's really important that we remain clear and consistent in our language about our expectations. So uh, I would be the first person to say, all right, if, you, you know, if you'd like to take on this research assignment and really do well, I'd really like you to do things the old school way first. Let's let's learn how to do a literature review. And I'd be perfectly happy to ask a student, all right, you need to convince me how an AI tool would help you learn. I don't think shortcuts are good for students at this age. It's one thing to be an adult in, you know, working in a marketing firm. Yes, an AI tool might help you get a good start on um, a, a marketing strategy. Fantastic. But students need different, different guidance and scaffolding. They're still developing their skills. So um, you need to close any potential loopholes. And uh, sometimes that's as simple as do not use any aid or resource that would give you an unfair advantage. And it's, you know, teachers can decide whether to, you know, allow AI tools to be used or not. Uh, certainly I've seen from working with um, one of my colleagues in visual arts on the IB comparative study, we, we really have to, we really, we use Google Classroom. We, we really have to be able to follow that um, that authentication process. We the students really need librarians to come in and explain why it's so important to you know make sure that it's clear when it's their analysis versus the research that helps enhance the depth of their comparative study and how that needs to be um, ex uh, how it needs to be paraphrased and cited accurately and clearly. So. Uh, one thing that uh, my school EF did very recently when we started talking about ChatGPT um, with um, uh, my colleagues in IT, with me, with our classroom colleagues, we looked at Bloom's taxonomy and we, we discussed where do tools fit best in the Bloom's taxonomy and what's knowledge in the age of artificial intelligence. And this is where we, this would be an excellent time for a breakout room. So I uh, we're going to move into breakout rooms so that you can discuss this um, in small groups and then feel free to put any insights into the chat or to put questions into the chat afterwards. So Joe, if you could set up the breakout rooms now. Of course. If you have any troubles joining a breakout room, please let me know and I can redirect you. I will pop in the question into the breakout room so you know what to discuss. And because I, I think we all benefit when we can share uh, insights with each other. Honestly, I tell the students all the time, as researchers, oftentimes the best insights arise in conversations because they can be so spontaneous. There's so much information that can be exchanged. So there are a couple of other um, areas that I'll touch on. But uh, again, if you had any interesting insights from the breakout rooms and you wish to put them in the chat, they are most welcome and they can be shared with everybody afterwards. 
And I didn't know if there were any questions right now um, about the, the Bloom's taxonomy question. And uh, sometimes questions take, take time to formulate, so you can put them in the chat at any time. I'll move on then. Uh, I wished to touch on copyright uh, briefly, because this could be a whole session on its own, but it's so tied to what we're doing and ever more so now in this age of generative, generative artificial intelligence. I just think it's, uh, I think it's good to remind both colleagues and students that copyright is an ethical decision to respect it. Um, We've always, for years, we've kind of, um, kind of had that kind of gray, fair use um, uh, blanket, if you will, to kind of protect us in um, our use of other people's work and images as students are learning to cite correctly. But I think we have to be very careful with all that's available now on the internet that we revisit the idea, basically, of what copyright is, because it is a form of respect. Um, it should be part of the digital curriculum because we have to think about the fact that generative artificial intelligence has built itself based on uh, going through mountains and mountains and mountains of data that other people have created. And often this, create, this contains copyrighted material. Um, I included a link to the US Copyright Office because recently they, uh, they came uh, to a decision um, about uh, a particular comic book that was um, partially AI um, created. And I think it's very, very important to remember, and I've put this quote from a wonderful Financial Times writer, Anna Nicolaou, here in the slide, the output that you get from the convenience of using um, an AI tool is due to the fact that AI has been going through mountains and mountains and mountains of data, and they've been benefiting from the artist's intellectual property. So when we talk about artists, I talked with a visual arts colleague recently, the same colleague with whom I collaborate in the classroom uh, for um, uh, research skills for comparative studies and, and other art projects that will require a research component. And um, her perspective was, we really have to uh, stay with, create original work and, and acknowledge inspiration where it comes from, and always provide captions. Uh, captions instruction is always worth the time it takes, because once the students understand the process, it really makes sense to them, and they put it in automatically. Essentially, what my lovely colleague said was, please stick to creating. Please don't rely on other people's work. And we do have to think about if a generator, generative AI tool is used, how is the original the original artist credited? That's that's going to be even more important. Uh, and we we have not only DALE and stable diffusion, um, you know, enhancing art that's already been created, but we have to also think about the area of video and deep fakes and. Uh, just the idea of, well, now we have to evaluate where this comes from, what kind of a message does it send, and the students need to be able to do the same. Uh, I read recently that Photoshop is coming out with a, a beta tool um, where they will have what they call a nutrition label. It, their beta tool is generative, gener generative fill, and they will have kind of a nutrition label saying how much of the artwork was the original work of an artist and what was enhanced or included. Uh, kind of, it's part of what they call their um, uh, content authenticity initiative. So I'm sure there'll be some interesting discussions that come up around this. And then I spoke with a music colleague. Uh, and it's interesting because the music, uh, the music teachers and composers, there's a little bit of a, it, the challenge is a little different. When we're talking about research, uh, it's very much a concern that uh, these AI tools are very easy for students to use. However, it always comes with caveats because the AI tools don't think, they only predict. And uh, recently, my colleague actually read um, several paragraphs of, of a research essay and it was completely wrong because AI named the wrong composer and my, my colleague, the human, knew the composer's work very well. So again, that whole sense of 
really evaluation and uh, evaluating and fact checking what you are actually reading, not just accepting it, is a really important element here. But in terms of actual use of the AI tool with the guidance of a music teacher, say during a performance, that actually might provide some great learning opportunities. So it's really up to us as educators to set the terms about creation of work, uh, ethical decisions, and uh, how we control and use the tools. So to return to Carol Kulfa, uh, another good discussion topic, I wish we had time because we could go on for a very, very long time and the scope would probably go way, way out there. Uh, but it would be a good idea to maybe talk about the information search process. I've included the PDF at the uh, at the end of this um, presentation so that you can access uh, the full text, but it really might be a good idea following on the Bloom's taxonomy discussion to think about where AI tools could affect uh, the information search process, because we really are talking about, as librarians and researchers, we're really talking about understanding and finding meaning, not just collecting stuff and compiling it and then, you know, kind of presenting it. If it, if it hasn't really enhanced our ability to understand and learn and grow from this, then we're only shortchanging ourselves. And we, we really need to let the students learn this in a structured environment to make their, their further studies uh, both satisfying and successful. Uh, a term that came up at the ACAA, AI, which concerned all of them, was cognitive offloading. It's a great sounding term, and I worry that it might uh, it might become too easily used as a buzzword. How they defined it at the conference at the university level was assigning lower level tasks to a tool. And we know that uh, students need to understand how to use artificial intelligence tools skillfully because this will be a part of further education. This will be a part of their future employment. But because they're students and they're younger, they need more scaffolding. And uh, this is where we come in. This is where our primary school colleagues and middle school colleagues come in as well. Uh, the, the sooner that we can start these critical thinking skills as just um, a regular way of learning, especially bringing the librarian in to collaborate, it, it's going to be a richer experience for all of the students. Now, recently, there was a Financial Times article, and I put this in only because I immediately thought of students. And it, this, this quote says, the latest AI launches will allow users to input text queries and receive entire documents or emails generated by AI, and also allow them to create AI-generated images in slideshows and auto-generate tables. This is too slick and easy for me. I Alarm bells went off all over my head because if, if we... We rely Google on Google heavily as it is. Some of us use Google lightly. Some of us use Google regularly. Some of us overuse Google. It's so it's such an effective tool. It is part of, of our everyday lives to one extent, extent or another. But we really have to be careful guiding students here because you can't give a student an editing tool before the student knows how to write. That's the way, what I always come back to. So some initiatives to start now. I always want people to be able to take something away from a discussion. So uh, feel free to take any or all of these suggestions or perhaps these suggestions will inspire. So I would absolutely draft or revisit an information skills timeline. And I would then make an appointment with your admin or your dean to have a discussion at the beginning of the next academic year. Um, I would strongly, I strongly urge you to consider joining the ICAI so that you can, we can really help um, close any gaps in the continuum. It's, they're a wonderful organization. I think it's about $150 for an individual membership. And uh, you really will learn so much. And there are various chapters. So uh, you can find a local chapter. Um, Start or expand your Honor Council student participation. Have the students write some critical thinking scenarios from their perspective about what academic integrity means. And start a discussion about where AI tools might fit in the information search process. 
So I've included some resources. Uh, Digital Trends is an online magazine that is free to access the full text. It is very industry wide, but they do have spotlights on um, particular tools that will affect education, of which Cactus AI was one of the latest writing tool developments. Uh, the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, they are a collection of large language model researchers, and they are trying to democratize artificial intelligence research. So their site is free to access as well. Uh, the Financial Times, if your school does not already have a subscription, I urge you to contact them. They have a B2B secondary school program for international schools. Sometimes it takes a few emails back and forth to get the negotiations going, but the Financial Times is a superbly written publication, so it'll be good for the students to read um, a different text type. Uh, there are many articles on artificial intelligence, not on the business end, uh, on the ethical design and uh, development of artificial intelligence tools. You can read a, almost daily. There are excellent articles in the Financial Times. Plus, they have a good geopolitics coverage as well. Uh, the ISS EduLearn workshops that have come out, they're fantastic. I attended one last week, and I got to listen to some very, very uh, interesting discussions from primary school teachers uh, at Saigon South International and Korea International School, where they were starting academic integrity discussions and, and analyzing of, uh, using AI tools from an academic integrity perspective in the primary schools. So these students are going to be well equipped by the time they come up through the continuum. And it's, re it's really important that we all connect from primary through middle, through secondary, through uh, further, further education. Uh, the MIT Technology Review, that's subscription only, but I put it in here because it's an excellent publication to read. And they're really covering a lot of very thoughtful areas in artificial intelligence research. Uh, Quanta Magazine. Originally, it was kind of the, the math, the biology, the physics, the computer science um, magazine. It, this is free to access as well, but now they have a lot of articles about artificial intelligence and education, and the articles are very readable. They're written by experts for uh, a larger audience than just their subject cohorts. Uh, Science Direct newsletter, it's available through Elsevier. This is how I found the open access journal Computers in Education, where I've been able to read a lot of research articles about um, how AI is affecting education. There's a link to the US Copyright Office. I'm sure everybody's aware of JSTOR Daily, but I include it because it was a great article a few weeks ago, a bot might have written this. This is becoming more and more our reality. Uh, and then if you wanted to, uh, to use some case studies, either from the book Building Honor and Academics, or if you wanted to write some, this is the structure I was given at the workshop. Um, I'm somebody who likes to really make sure everybody learns something, so I almost give away the answer too quickly. I had to really scale back and understand that um, I could provide the synopsis and structure first, but then it's really the discussion from all the participants. And as the kind of the facilitator, I had to make sure everybody did participate, but also hold back from blurting out the answer, so to speak. And there are always there's always more than one audience, especially when we're talking about case studies in in education and learning. So here are my works cited, uh, and you should be able to access the the um, the Kulfa, um PDF of um, uh, the information search process. Uh, you will need a Financial Times subscription, I think, to read um, the the articles that I put in from the FT. But if you want to contact me, I'd be happy to provide PDFs. Uh, and then the U.S. Copyright Office definitely you'll be able to access that. And by the way, I'd like to just close on this thought. I learned a lot from being able to participate in that case study compilation to produce a book of case studies that really provided a wide range of understanding about what different educators are facing. How about if we ECIS librarians compile our own collection of case studies? We have so much, we have so much expertise and experience and we're entering this whole new world of very interesting times. I think it would be wonderful if we put together a publication of case studies based on our experiences as well. 
So just, just to think about that. And uh, I think I'm very close to the time. So I just want to thank everybody so much for attending. And if there are any questions that I could answer right now. Thanks so much, Vivian. Yeah, if you put your questions in the chat, I can put, uh, read those out for her. Um, in the meantime here, I just wanna say thank you to Vivian for your great presentation. And I'm sure we're all walking away with new ideas on artificial intelligence and academic integrity that we can implement in our schools. Um, Aaron Wilson is uh, mentioned says that you mentioned earlier about following on LinkedIn someone named Jesse. We were wondering, yes. wondering what the name of that person was. Oh, it's Jesse Townsend, T O W N S E N D. And he did give me permission to, um, he did give all of us permission to follow him on LinkedIn if we would like at the conference. So. I wouldn't do that otherwise. I would make sure I had his permission. <laughs> and then uh, Bobby asked, would you be willing to share the infographic of your research continuum timeline? I would, uh, that would be fine as well. Um, I just ask that um, as far as the graphic design goes that um, we credit the International School Basel. I created the content, but um, they, uh, they had a lovely graphic designer create that beautiful layout. Okay. And, and yes, uh, Pascal, this will be recorded um, and we'll be sharing that out uh, via email later on. And we'll also be posting it on our webpage and Facebook and social media. Um, I think there's another question here from Elizabeth. There is so many conversations in education about AI. How can, how can individual school librarians make sure they are part of this conversation? Oh yes, this is very important. We have to we have to we have to make meetings with admin. We have to make sure that everybody understands everybody is a stakeholder in this. Admin, classroom colleagues, parents, teachers. Um, I tend to be very persistent. I really try to get myself into meetings, either um, you know, academic leadership or um, meetings at the beginning of the year. It's it's you really have to be persistent and get on a, somebody's timetable, and that usually means bringing some good ideas with you, so you can then say, you know, I've been thinking about these issues. Here are some possible ideas. I'd really like to meet with you to discuss them. Sometimes you have to go very methodically. Sometimes you have to go colleague by colleague to build that kind of understanding that can then achieve critical mass. I've always gone from colleague to colleague. I try to approach the most uh, amenable colleagues first to really provide some good evidence. And uh, I actually, uh, I've been talking with a math and science colleague about um, collaboration opportunities that we would present to the faculty at the beginning of the academic year and possibly write an article about. So it really is about starting a conversation with the colleagues, and sometimes it has to go by individual or maybe department. Okay. If there's anyone else, you can post it in. In the meantime, I'm going to post a couple of links in the chat. Um, before you go, um, the committee would love to hear your feedback about the webinar. Um, so please complete the feedback form I posted in the chat. We're also going to be emailing this out with the recording. Um, so if you want to do it later, that's fine also. Um, this will help us not only improve our webinars, but keep on giving you the events and services that you love. Also, um, just some advertisements here. Um, the ECIS committee, we're looking for additional committee members for the library committee. So, and also webinar propose, proposals. If you have an idea for a webinar also, um, please consider applying at the links I've shared. And that looks like, I think that's it for today. Um, please join us on June 19th for our next episode of Lessons from the Library when Manga Maven Jillian Rudes will talk with us about the value of Manga in libraries and how it can be a support system for the social emotional development of students. And you can register at the link in the chat. So see you next time. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, everybody.
Have a great day. It was a real privilege. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.